major skiing accident in Canada had left Stefan unable to walk or talk. I mean, if you can imagine somebody coming at you with a very large hammer and beating you on the head, it's something like that. I mean, they made it pretty clear that if he did survive, there was going to be every chance he was going to be fairly majorly impaired. When he was getting better, recovering, it was like watching a two-year-old grow up to a late teenager within a few months. The trauma to Stefan's brain means he'll never be quite the same again. Stefan's accident says much about the brain's ability to recover. It was just an unlucky thing. Maybe it's like I was meant to have this new life, meant to have this whole new extreme learning experience that I'm having now. At 24, Stefan Hadfield was a superman, admired by his mates. A university graduate, he had a mathematical mind and was a qualified geologist. He was sought out by a group of international extreme adventurers to take part in a challenge never attempted, to traverse pole to pole using only manpower. The trip had taken him to Canada for training. Even there, he instantly became leader of the pack. He stood out straight away. Capable physically, really warm and supportive of people. Someone that was a bit different to your everyday kind of bloke. And he had lots of integrity, or does have lots of integrity. So he was a great leader. On March the 1st, 2007, Stefan was skiing on these slopes at Whistler, Canada. With him, two of his friends, Dave Henley and Eric Hughes. The three daredevils had gone off-piste in search of the highest drop-offs. These boys thought nothing of plunging over a face 40 metres high. Yeah, it was, just, it was just a fun morning skiing, you know, out in beautiful terrain and having fun and laughing and just doing what you do when you're skiing, you know. Some, there was definitely some steep stuff and it was, I think we did a couple of double diamonds, but it wasn't, actually, well, I mean, there was some pretty big, big stuff we did. Stefan was like, come on, mate, let's go faster the whole time. So he was, uh, he was goading Eric on the whole day. It was quite funny. Stefan's life changed in a moment. Suddenly I heard Eric call out. Just, Dave, just screamed from, he was way up above me, but then I'd skied down quite a long way. And he just shouted out, Dave, Dave. Um, Stefan's fallen. Stefan's fallen. Stefan had been skiing at speed along an icy ledge when he careered down a cliff face, smashing his head on a rock before colliding into a tree. And I was just really, really surreal from that moment on. Stefan's brain injury is described as the most severe ever seen on Whistler. Other skiers who have sustained injuries of this level have died. And he was just moaning. Straight away you could tell he wasn't at all well. It really felt like he was going to stop breathing any second. So we made the decision to move him. Basically I dug out a bit of a trench underneath this tree that we could lay him in. He started to hurt when we moved him. He had a broken hip and a whole lot of other things and probably a pretty sore head. His eyes were just open. He was still conscious a little bit. And it just looked like he was screaming out from inside his body going, What's just happened? This is wrong. I want to get out of here. I don't know what's going to happen from here. I don't know if he's going to be really badly brain damaged. I don't know if he's going to be dead. This could be the end of Stefan. And then before we knew it, there was doctors everywhere. Didn't have blood everywhere. It didn't have massive injuries in his face. He was just drooling and, and making quite a noise, but quite quickly after that he went quite calm. They spent, I think, nearly an hour and a half on the snow with him, stabilising him, so they, they suddenly went in a hurry to move him because things were so critical, I guess. I had my camera with me and I actually, I thought, felt a bit morbid doing it because I thought, who gets their camera out and takes photos of their mate when they're injured? But at the same time I thought, well, actually, this could be really helpful later on for Stefan or for his family.
people matter. In Hamilton, New Zealand, Stefan's dad, John Hadfield, took the call he'd always dreaded. I got a, a phone call from one of the guys up there, a friend of Stefan's, and it was pretty difficult to hear, actually. I think they had to three or four attempts to get the whole message through. But even on the first call, it was, Stefan's been skiing something or other, and, you know, I could just tell it wasn't about we had a good day. Well, I mean, they just said straight away, you know, where are you? How long before you get here? It's, it's very serious. We're not sure he, you know, we can survive him. It was a full 24 hours before John could get hold of a doctor to learn if his son was alive or dead. When girlfriend Madeline took a call, she excitedly expected to hear Stefan's voice. Instead it was his friend telling me um, the most terrible news I've ever had in my whole life. When Stefan's head smashed into the tree, it shattered his skull, causing damage to both sides of his brain. Stefan was rushed by helicopter to Vancouver General Hospital. There, swelling and pressure escalated inside Stefan's brain. Doctors recorded it as out of control. Surgeons inserted a tube deep inside his brain to drain the central canals. If you put a drain and you can remove some of the fluid and allow the brain to have a bit more space to swell, it also means you can monitor the pressure inside the head. The hospital model of Stefan's skull shows the extent of damage caused by the impact of his accident. It left his entire brain traumatised. No one truly believed he could survive. When it smacked against the rock, this fragmented. He would have had fragments going into the brain. He would have had lacerations. There would be a, a very high danger of infection. John Hadfield flew 28 hours from New Zealand to Canada and feared his son might not be alive when he got there. Nothing could prepare him for the state Stefan was in. When we arrived, you know, he was plugged into every gadget imaginable. The doctor reiterated that it was really serious and, and uh, he didn't know what the outcome would be. Within the first few days, Stefan underwent emergency surgery twice as doctors strive to stop the hemorrhaging inside his brain. I mean, we even had a discussion at that stage of how do you make the call on whether Stefan would have a lifestyle that even he would be happy with, you know? 19 days after his accident, Stefan stirred from his coma. Relief turned to horror when his family realised how severely brain damaged Stefan was. He had virtually no vision, no speech, and absolutely no idea where he was, who they were, or who he was. I think the only thing we could do was deal with each moment as it came, really. Um, trying to think too far ahead didn't really help. Having spent 100 days in Vancouver Hospital, doctors judged Stefan strong enough to be flown back to New Zealand to continue his treatment close to family. My first memory was when we landed in New Zealand. And I asked, are we in New Zealand now? The answer was yes, and I was like, oh, good. Girlfriend Madeline had spent weeks waiting to be reunited with Stefan, but the accident had obliterated his memories of their time together. I remember her from before the accident, and then when I saw her again finally, I just said, hello, hello girl. I didn't know what her name was, and that took me quite a long time to get back to knowing. Madeline had expected to care for Stefan, but as a girlfriend, not as his mother. When I had the accident, that's when that brought me back to being like a young child, because I thought I was three years old at the time. I just, everything was just going around and around and around in my head. I didn't know much at all. You go from, at first, somebody who is learning to do all the basic functions all over again. It's not exactly like a, a baby, but it's like someone who's taking first steps at everything all over again, and so you, very much in need of support and you have to be sort of there to help them do everything. I was 21 when I met him. That's quite young, <laughs> I'm aware. I'm aware that um, somebody having such an accident, I could have just easily moved on and wiped the dust off my shoulders and said, oh well, what a pity. But I just thought I'd be patient and see what happened.
Three months after the accident, Stefan's life was again at risk. Weak and fragile, he contracted a hospital superbug. It attacked the area of his head that had slammed into the rock. The massive bone fragments and brain tissue became grossly infected. Again, his head swelled, forcing his eyes shut. His condition became critical. To stop the infection spreading, surgeons removed all of the fractured bone, leaving a gaping hole in his skull. His brain's only protection today is a synthetic plate. Now I can knock both sides and that feels fine, it feels normal. Nothing strange. If I poke in here, it's safe. Put my finger there. I don't want to push because that I could push my finger in there. That's the one spot that could be a bit risky. Back home, he grows strong once more, but huge chunks of his former life are blanked, seemingly forever. Ah, oh, no! See if, because you got that in, you should put it Madeline up. believes she can make a difference and abandons tertiary study to help Stefan relearn. We always used to play things like hangman or guess which utensil he was holding when he was drying the dishes and I was washing them. That kind of crazy stuff that you do with little kids. <laughs> and I'm glad that didn't last forever. <laughs> the process of his recovery has puzzled everyone. There were so many gaps in his understanding of day-to-day -day life. Yet Stefan recovers much of his athleticism and strength. We don't understand what the circuitry is for those different things or where exactly some of those things are in his brain. So it's, it's hard to know what has been damaged and what hasn't and what things over time Stefan has now adjusted and learned to do it using different pathways. Pre-accident Stefan spoke a dozen languages. Words trickle back, but he has no idea which language he's using. If I thought about what I couldn't do, that would be depressing, but I think about what I can do, and because I love the things I can do, that's what motivates me to get better quicker. Stefan once knew complex mathematical equations. Now he's forgotten even simple things. He's having to completely relearn the sort of music and clothes he likes, even the food he likes to eat. He had some pretty strange eating habits. He would survive on those liquid meals for starters and, and um, then he'd eat any old, anything that was sweet and he'd mix tomatoes and grapes and start with anything that was dessert and sort of, I don't know, it was, it was a really strange mixture. Now I know what I like. I know which colours I like. I know which food I like. I know what activities I like. <laughs> <laughs> Just here, please. Oh, yeah. How's it going, bro? Good, thanks. Good to see you, man. <laughs> a long time. No Stefan's skiing mate Dave Henley is home. Um, yeah, so what's it, what's it like <laughs> seeing these images, these new memories or old memories? It's Dave's second um, visit to Stefan, but last time one, Stefan had I no idea who Dave was. This whole process of yeah. getting back to some of these memories mm is not just a new thing for me. Two and a half years now. Yeah. Whenever he's so, confronted with yeah, something I'm, from the past, Stefan it. sees it as a challenge. I keep enjoying the bits that's like, oh, yeah, because the stuff that links up to more than just the basic photo I see, yeah. it links up to experience, experience, experience. Mm -hmm. And you were up in these trees here. Yeah. So from there to there, we've been like 30, 40 metres. Yeah. In vertical. Mm. Don't know. I have no memory. No. I've ever been skiing at Whistler. Yeah. But you know, really nice to hear the stories and see the photos and mm. I guess the more the more I hear, the more I'll at least have the info in my head. Mm. And I'm keen to go check it out. Yeah? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, for sure. Just probably not too soon. <laughs> <laughs> Madeline has stayed by Stefan's side for two years now. Cool. Time to go. Dad... They're off on a camping trip, just like the old days. Months of patience have paid off. He's a real boyfriend again. A little more quirky. She didn't just go, oh well, and, and move on. She stuck with me. She stayed with me and 
the fact that I came back, I literally couldn't do the walking and talking for a while and I couldn't really eat. I didn't really know much about myself, my history or anything. But she stuck with it. She stuck with me the whole time. You just had to take a step back and just be friends again. And that was for quite some time. But um, you could tell that he knew <laughs> the difference between me and other friends, you know, like um, he was more emotional towards me. She believed in miracles and I, because of that belief from her end, got to the point of achieving that miracle, which seems like, to me now, it seems straightforward, but when I think about what I actually went through, it's like, how did I do that? I went from not having a proper head, not being able to breathe, see or hear, and here I am, I can be silly again. I'm happy I can be silly. Legally, Stefan's unable to drive. That's a cause of frustration. He's got to a point where he's done most of his recovery. Every day you could see before that he was definitely learning and recovering. But now you think to yourself, oh, I wonder if he's learning anymore. But actually he is, he's still learning. And I think it will take maybe another two or three years until he's maybe back to where he started. Stefan never knows when a former talent is going to re-emerge. A year earlier, he didn't even know what a guitar was. Now he's playing better than he used to. Come on, cooker, pick up the pace. <laughs> <laughs> go, cooker, go, cooker, go, go, cooker. <laughs> Went to the shop to buy some cheese, but they didn't have a flavour that I pleased. So we settled for budget. Instead, <laughs> I think it kind of tastes like plastic. Good plastic. It's quite <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> mm. Is this good? Yeah. The reason for some of those tasks, like climbing and guitar playing, coming back, I don't know exactly. What's Bukachi? It's like. You say she she, mm. thank you, and bukachi, it's like no problem. All oh, right. I think the reason that it might have happened is because I started learning those when I was young. And so I've had a lot of experience in my life time-wise with those. But you're not, because you do it all the time. Up till now, he's been like a toddler. Now Stefan's becoming teenage-like. Despite the risk to his skull, he's hankering for adventure. He's convinced everyone around him that he should be allowed to enter a bike race. The ride is up Mount Ruapehu, the highest mountain in New Zealand's North Island. Well, it's called the Cooney Climber, which is a race up Mount Ruapehu to a ski area. Um, it's 17 kilometres in distance. It goes from 697 metres to 1,780 metres, so it's just over a kilometre in height, just altitude. I worked out the average angle of that would be 22.6 degrees. That'll be an interesting challenge for me considering my very low level of training to date. I think it's fantastic that Stefan's going to get back into such events. That's what he kind of lives for. Whereas once Stefan would be out to win, he claims he's now happy to simply cool. take so part. I can register here. Before, he, he was very much someone who said, why not be, I don't know, the best at something or to be really good at something? Now, now it's like, if he gets the chance to do a lot of these things and do them well again, that's a pretty good target. So there's a little, a little change in there, I think. Number 26. Cool, thank you. That's just one year younger than me, though. A lot of people here have got prepared with their cycle shirts on, their cycle pants. They look like they're ready for cycling. Um, I'm pretty serious too, because I'm wearing orange and that's my favorite. So I think that's the, the key thing, to be happy. I think happiness is the key to doing well. But um, I'm not an extreme dresser for those events often, so I tend to like to wear stuff I like, rather than what is gonna be 
beneficial for the event itself. I like the orange pants, I like the orange t-shirt, I like the orange hat. There's one reason for that, I like orange. Oh, good luck, Stefan. Cool, thanks. I'll be timing you. I think he'll, he won't come first, but he definitely won't come last. Yeah, he's pretty fit. Before the accident, I found it amazing the sort of things that he was capable of, actually. So when he had this, it just seemed to me such a shame that someone who'd been sort of right at the, the peak of his capability and, and doing so many things in quite an amazing fashion should get suddenly laid so low. Stefan constantly promotes himself and his recovery to anyone who will listen. In part, he needs to remind himself how well he's doing. I was in a cone for 19 days. I thought I wouldn't be able to walk or talk or anything. Oh. Didn't think I could see. Didn't think I was going to live. You're an inspiration. <laughs> I did get a little bit tired when I was talking because I was like telling quite a lot and he said a couple of words back and I talked, 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 talked and I still felt okay so I kept talking. Maybe a bit more of a workout but I thought it was nice to share information rather than try to beat him. Some guy just passed me. <laughs> he must be in a hurry. <laughs> Is it the finish? <laughs> Destination already. I thought we were about two thirds or three quarters up. I made it from bottom to top. I'm alive. I smile. I'm happy. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Stefan's often striving to impress Madeline. She can tell he's frustrated by his limitations. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so only five seconds, not seven again. <laughs> Never really seen a man cry much, but I've seen tears in his eyes. <laughs> um, he gets concerned. He's, he's not one to admit being in a negative way, but he has been. And... Um, he usually brings me up if I'm down, so <laughs> even if he's down. So I do the same back for him. He gets worried sometimes. And he has said to me on a couple of occasions that he just wants to impress me the way he used to impress me. And I've said, well, you still do impress me. But I think he just feels like he's on show the whole time. Three years ago, Stefan Hadfield was one of New Zealand's finest rock climbers. Extreme sports were his thing. He's decided he's ready to get out there again. Because I have no memory of the crash or of anything negative about skiing, I'm not afraid of it at all. I'm, rather than being afraid, I'm keen. Nice to be safe in the helmet these days, you know, not going to break my head again. Cadrona Ski Field near Queenstown is holding the annual sports festival for disabled sportsmen and women. If there's ever a safe time to give skiing a go, it's now. I understand a lot about what happens sort of after life too, because I essentially was in that process for a moment and it's just, it's nice to be back. I can be a proper human again. In his earlier life, Stefan was a ski instructor in Switzerland. The skiing has come straight back to him. Okay. Should we give it a go, Stefan? Yeah. Stefan. Hello. <laughs> Stefan's back, doing what he's always done, enjoying life, having fun, and not taking anything too nice. seriously. Nice to feel what the rhythm is again. I was really keen to see if I could ski, but one of the things that I was keen for was to know if when I'm skiing, whether I get a memory back to when I had the crash, whether it would just take me back to something from just before, whether it would bring back bad memories, good memories or something. 
It didn't bring anything negative back at all. I, I still have no memory of the skiing when I crashed. I just remember all the good stuff I did before it. It's just nice to be back skiing, just back doing one of the things I love to do. One of the many things I love to do, but it was the one that sort of finished me off. But it didn't finish me completely. I can start again.